Bismillah min ash-shaytan wa bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim alhamdulillah thumma salatu wa sallam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh just to be sure that you can see my screen and you can see me as well yes visible you can see you okay okay alhamdulillah so um I'm grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given all of us this opportunity to be here this Saturday morning. Um, and I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the organizers for this. And I want to have also appreciate them for giving me adequate time because they gave me enough time and Elijah Sawa was always on my case. Okay, so to this morning, so that we will not take too much time. I know I have very limited time. I'm talking to the to the experience so because when they told me i want to come and speak with the last omega the big boys the engineers i was scared that what would i tell them but i decided to console myself by saying that um we'll just come here to remind everybody what we already know because i'm not sure there's anything new of telling this um this set of experienced people spread across the globe so well, at least, so if there's anything you feel I did not say quite all right, please pardon my ignorance. I'm just a little boy trying to present myself to the big boys and the, the professors on the call. So we've been asked to discuss planning for a blissful retirement. Please, can you just give me one second? One second, please. Okay. Right. So I think we should just slide forward. And the first one is why are we discussing retirement? Why are we discussing retirement? Um, first retirement for five reasons, and I think it's very critical that we discuss about it at this time of our lives. Um, number one reason why we are discussing it is in, is enlightening ourselves on the current pensions in Nigeria, so that at least you understand if you have anything from the government or if you are meant to expect anything from the government at all, how should you structure yourself and all of that. Secondly, is to also sensitize ourselves to be deliberate about our retirement plans while in active service so that we can cover our unplanned and unforeseen expenses after active retirement or active service. All of us, we are currently working, probably you are doing business, you are doing eight to five, you are moving around and, doing, and generating income on a periodic basis. Some of us, we get our money daily. Some of us, we get it back. Some of us will get it per month, and some people they get it quarterly. All of these incomes they real they come to us, and as a result, in active service. But there will be a time where the real source of income will be cut off, and we will be dependent on our real income, our investors are no longer earning active income. So we should be deliberate about that. That's one of the reasons why we are discussing this. The third reason is for us to be able to maintain our desired lifestyle after retirement. Just to be sure, you can hear me very well, right? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, cool. So to maintain our desired lifestyle after retirement, right? So a, a, a lot of us currently, we, we live a particular lifestyle and we are hoping that once we retire, we want to either maintain that lifestyle or make it better. A lot of us, we do not do vacation now because we are not financially buoyant, but we want to retire well with something cool for ourselves, taking our idea or our ideas for, for vacation, our kids, our grandchildren coming to visit us. We want to maintain that kind of lifestyle. For us to maintain it, then it is important that we discuss, um, we discuss our retirement now. The fourth thing is to provide financial security for us and our loved ones. Today, we have um, children, right? Or some of us might not have, but at some point in our lives, we want to start um, not only providing financial security for ourselves, we want our grandchildren to come to us, we want, them, we want to be able to give them money, we want them to grandma, and as well have financial capability to defend that. If it is that, it is our thing, then it is important to discuss it at this earlier stage. And lastly, is for us all to be balanced. To have a 360 perspective to our personality and ensure that we have planned our lives from cradle to grave. Throughout the journey from cradle to grave, one of the important life or milestones in our life will be when we are retired. 
that life, we need to plan properly and ensure that we are planning it. The committee have decided to talk about blissful uh, retirement, right? And just to tell us, for, for someone like me, I, I always dream about what I think I want to do when, I, when I'm retired. Most of the time, what I always say is that I want to be that kind of person that, um, that somebody will come like, I used to joke about that. I just say, I'll put glasses on the tip of my nose and they'll be asking, allergic lefege, allergic, what do you want to? And I'll tell them, ginger eh, tea, I'll be mocking and be painting the scenario of the lifestyle I intend to live when I retire. All right. And that is why it's critical for us to all, all of us to start planning about that, that lifestyle we intend to get after work. So I think the next slide is now talking about 360 degree personality. And that's just like, I just want to show you to tell us that our lives as we move on. When you're planning your retirement, you should plan it across these six critical components. It is important for us to have our spirituality sorted as part of our plans. Our physical lifestyle, our medical lifestyle, we should plan it as well. Our soft skill at that time, we should plan it. What kind of skill do I need when I'm retired, right? Our technical skills, if you need any forever for whatever reason, right? There's some do it yourself, do I that you can also learn to keep you busy and busy and engaged when you're retired. And then digital skill is also very important. A lot of us will think that as a retired person, why do I need digital skills? At that time, our children were talking about metaverse. Our children will be telling us that that the deal land that you have at Mowe, I want to sell it so that we can go and buy a land in the metaverse. You should be able to connect to those children, just like most of us today, our parents are able to connect to us. They are far away from us. You explain to very, very, what you think is very basic concepts to them, they are lost. So as people preparing for retirement, ensure that you have a roadmap that you'll be able to cover yourself. But I think the purpose of this discussion is actually more for financial. So we're going to delve more into that particular aspect. So we need financial skills for us to be able to identify our needs and also plan our financials based on what we currently have, right? And then we can have a good retirement. So to me, based on what I've planned to discuss, I've discussed why we are discussing this. We are discussing this because of those five salient points that I've mentioned earlier. I've also told us that it's part of our 360 degrees that we should do. So now we want to talk about what, what exactly. So we, we intend to answer some questions on that what. The first, we want, the first question we want to answer on that what is the pension scheme in itself. How did the pension scheme started? Right, and for us to also understand basic terminologies. Well, number one is retirement and common pension. We need to understand that retirement is when you withdraw from active work, either mandatory or voluntary. Once you are no longer doing active work, unable to, if you're a, if you're a telecom engineer, you're not able to start checking all of those different things log on to the optimization and all of that. I'm not able to do that again. If I put that manager, you're also not initiating, monitoring, controlling, and all of that. So you're no longer doing all those active work lifestyle. We withdraw for that, and that is what is called retirement. But what is pension? Pension is a fixed amount of money that is paid to people that are no longer working or no longer in active service on a periodic basis, either by government, the new employer, formal employer, or the pension fund administrator. So, seem to differentiate this to me for academic reasons. On some of retirement, they are no longer working and pension, they are getting periodic pay. So, the next thing is now for us to discuss about how did we even come about this retirement plan? Because a lot of people, to be out of ignorance, sometimes they cause the government and they read them and criticize them because feel that different thing is not really good for us, right? But if you take us, if you take ourselves through a bit of memory lane and you understand how and why government arrived at this current um, contributory pension scheme that we currently have, I believe that appreciate it. We now know how to now build it to our favor, right? The first thing is 
before this current scheme that we have, the government was using what they call GBS. They call it defined benefit scheme. And how does this work? This is basically designed in such a way that once you are employed by the government, from the day you are very clear that I have a defined benefit payment that I'm entitled to as a worker of the government, right? So I'm going to break it down into the public sector and the private sector. So once you come, you have an idea, once I spend 10 years in civil service with the government, I'm entitled to X amount of money as my gratuity and monthly basis, right? So that was what was called defined benefit scheme. Meaning that the, the, the benefit entitled to be defined earlier, right? Defined earlier by maybe government or whoever is in charge, right? And as a result, government on an annual basis will do a budget allocation for payment. Say for paying pensions for the transport authority, for paying pensions for NEPA, or for paying pensions for a railway corporation, we'll be budgeting 10 billion. One trillion and all of that, all that. And as a result of that, that money is expected to be used when each of those people are returning. But unfortunately, those terms were, were not adequate, right? Inflation will affect that money. Sometimes they do investment with them, embezzlement, people embezzle this money. They were not able to implement this successfully, right? And as a result of that, government was not able to fund that scheme seamlessly and that's why you see um railways retirees and a child retiree coming out with placards protesting complaining that they've not received their money because it was just the same way all budget allocations managed right so you know they will have budgeted for Ibadan, Lagos Ibadan Express Road the implementation is a problem right all of that were still the same problem that people were facing in under that scheme because it was strictly around budget allocation available availability of fund from the government it will also be impacted by um maybe oil price based on what the economic power of the government will have direct impact on this so if they are not able to do it, they will not be able to do it so as the government felt that the dbs could not be sustained secondly in the pre, in the private sector Hardly would you have a pension scheme for private sector. A lot of us today, for every company we work, we have a pension scheme, no matter how small. We're looking forward to bonus. We're looking forward to those things, no matter how small. Why? Because before now, there was nothing like that in private sector. There was not a lot of, except the big, big companies like the Chevron of this world, like the Lafarge of this world, big, big companies, but the regular private institutions, were not preparing for it. As a result, there was no money for people. So when you retire, you're on, you're on your own. Once you retire, the only thing you get is that you get money. They, 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 I think they call it, um, they just pay you off. And that would be the end. And then you are left to struggle, right? And also the little schemes that we had there, little, because of knowledge gap from the people managing it, and also a lot of malpractice as well, people squandered money. And as a result, it was very clear from either private sector or public sector, the defined benefit scheme was not sustainable. So government decided that they would learn something different. And particularly what they did was that they sent some people to Chile to go and learn how they have implemented the uh, pension scheme. And on the next slide, basically it was clear, it was during the regime of Obasanjo where it launched we we'll call the pension industry today. And basically, that was where all of this conversation around what have as pensions in today started. And this pension scheme is now called Contributory Pension Scheme, CPS. CPS was different from DBS, Defined Benefit Scheme. But this one is now called CPS, Contributory pension scheme. And what is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is that there's no budget allocation for this. There's no predefined amount that, is, that you'll be entitled to as a worker, either in the private sector or in the public sector, right? So government made it very clear. There is now a case of CPS in the Yoruba parlance. They will say, 
the Yemagbe for. Whatever you have contributed is a key factor to what you will get when you are retiring. So government no longer reserve one fund that some Rashid the Mayna of this world will sit down to embezzle. Government will not now reserve any money that people will go there and embezzle. So now contribute your money and then we will move on, right? And then because of that, they enacted an act. They called it Pension Reform Act, PRA 2004. And it was approved, is a law in Nigeria. And as a result, that law generated three operators in the so-called pension industry, right? I hope you can all hear confirm. We are hearing you. We are following. Okay. And I'm not too fast. I like this at all. They are fine. Okay. Okay. So thank you. So, so we're saying so because of that law, if three participators were three operators were um, generated from the PRA 2004, and they are called the Pencom. The, the so there's a national pension commission called Pencom. That is the regulator of this industry. It's a government body that regulates anyone that would like to operate in this pension, in the contributory pension scheme industry. Pencom will license whoever will work. Pencom will release guidelines to guide how the operators will manage the funds. And then there's another operator called PFC. A lot of us do not know PFC. A lot of us. We have an idea of PFA and we know PENCOM, but we might not know PFCs. PFCs are the people that receive the money from our employers. So if you are self-employed, PFCs are the bank that you pay the money into, right? So that is PFC. And then you have the PFA, which I work for one of them and the biggest of them, I say, Stabic Committee's Pension Managers, right? PFAs are the people that manages the fund. So let me now go back to now explain. Like I said, Pencom regulates the industry. They determine and license what happened in the industry. They can suspend, they can readmit, they can do whatever, they can sanction anybody in the industry. And that's why when you have any problem with your pension scheme in Nigeria, the highest body you can escalate to is National Pension Commission, Pencom, they are based in Abuja. And the truth is they are highly responsive, in fact, they are highly engaging. They are with one of them that came to do audit for us and told him, I've been targeted with all other um, regulators, but I can tell you, Pencom is hands on. They are in to, to watching everybody to ensure that you're doing the right thing. If you mess around, you get sanctioned. And they're sanctioned, you must pay, right? So that is Pencom. PFCs are the bank. So when you pay your money, so imagine. I am an employer, for instance. So let me use my employer, Stambic IBTC, as an employer, because we also pay pensions too, right? Stambic IBTC, as an employer, right, would take the, would pay your pension into a bank called Pension Fund Custodian. What do they do? What they do is they own the asset, they keep the asset. Your money with them, they, they keep it. All the money you contribute sits with them. Right, the cash, the actual cash. Your employer pays one thousand naira for you in the month of August. Sit with a PFC, pension fund custodian. I, I, I'll, I'll still get to the point of um, this thing. They are, I think they have about in Nigeria. Right, so they keep the money. So and then you now go to pension fund administrator. Administrator administer quote and unquote the money. They don't have access to that money. They only trade with the money. They invest the money. They administer the money, and that's the only thing they do. They only issue instructions to fund PFCs to release funds. So these three people, they are uh, three musketeers, right? <laughs> Nothing can go wrong within three of them, and they are independent, absolutely independent. Sometimes you see people talking about when they see maybe a blogger posting things about people stealing pension funds. They will say, they will call me, Kazim, I hope they've not stolen our money. I say, it is not possible. The cash, your money does not sit with us as PA. Your money sits with PFC. So let me just paint a cycle of inflow and outflow in this scheme. So for example, Mr. Saba, your employer is paying for your pension. So don't let us, I mean, I'm still on this slide. 
you want to pay your pension, so they will take the cash to the PFC to say Saba has 1,000 error for the month of August, right? That is what we want to pay for him. So the PFC will collect the money and notify the PFA. PFA, Saba's employer paid 1,000 error for him, invest this money and continue to manage it. So PFA will invest the money. They will notify Saba, we have received 1,000 error for you. On a monthly basis, they will tell Saba, we have received 1,000. On a quarterly basis, they will tell you, this year 1,000 naira is now 1,050 naira with the return on that money, right? The PFA is, in, is responsible for giving you a mobile app, like we have in Stambika BTC, we have a web portal, we have a USSG that you can check the balance, you can know. So you are interacting with a PFA, right? So you can see that, but your money does not sit with that PFA. On the return of your money, your money the return come into your investment is also dropping with the PFC. It is only reporting management of that fund that the PFAs are responsible for. For example, PFA will go to the market and buy different instruments to invest. They cannot also pay that. They will fund the PFC to pay on their behalf by telling PFC we have bought 1,000 units of sugar, Dangote sugar today. Pay the stock broken firm, and then they will pay. After all of these payments in and out of the money is being approved by income. So if you want to retire, for instance, you also come back. I Saba will approach us. I have 10 million in my account. I want to retire. Depending on the type of retirement, you will apply, right? And once you up, before you have been paid, we also write a letter to Pencom. want to pay a large Saba in the money. So what should we do? Pencom will say approve, pay. That approval will be presented to a PFC to release the fund for Saba. So you can see that the three uh, stakeholders, they work together, but they're highly independent. For any corruption to happen in, any, in, in this industry, PENCOM, PFC, and PFA, three of them must mutually agree to perpetrate that fraud, and it's really difficult, right? So that's that. So we come to the next slide, which is talking about... All right, Saba. Sorry, we can move to the next slide. So... The next slide is also talking about the PRA. So what are the things? So yes, so in 2014, because like I said, Pencom is always engaging and get, getting feedback. They realized that there are some components of the PRA 2004 raised by Obasanjo needed to be modified. So they, they did another one, they took it to the house and it was approved. And that is what we currently run with. So we call it PRA 2014. Just want to mention some of the things that changed. The before now, in PRA 2004, what was there was employer will contribute 7.5% of housing transport and basic. Why employee also contribute 7.5%, basically. So, but now they change it and say, employers should now pay 10%, while employees should pay 8% in the interest of the employee meaning that employer is paying more for that employee, 2% higher. Secondly, they also reduce the, the, the minimum requirements to set up a benefit, um, a, a PFA account or to register, to make it mandatory for an employer to open a, a, an account for their staff from five to three. So if you, if you have any company that has, in 2000, PRA 2014, it is not mandatory for you to open pension account for your staff if you have less than five. That was before. But in PRD 2014, it is mandatory for you to open once you are three. So if you can be yourself, your wife, <laughs> and your cleaner, if you are a company, then it's mandatory that three of you must have a pension account. And it's such an offense, actually. An employee, that's one of the rights. And it's go it is backed by law. If you are a company or you work for a company that has more than three, that has three or more than three employees, it is mandatory for you to have an account. Also, they review the penalties and sanctions for PFAs and players not deducting or remitting contribution within several days of payment. So if the employer is removing, deducting from your salary, um, pension contribution, it is mandatory for them to remit it for you within seven days, within seven days. 
if they don't, they are liable to sanction by income. So a lot of us, when we leave a company, you will see people say, ah, they removed my, they deducted my money, but I don't have that money. You are you are, have right to complain to that employee, right of official to that employee, right to pen come and then copy your PSA saying that I have not received my entitlement from this company and they will be they will pay it. In fact, Pencom will force them to pay it with interest, right? Also, the modality of also managing what we call um, temporary pin, or yeah, so we to call it TCF. No, it's the, we call it TCF, Station Contributor. So there are some employees that will refuse to open an account. They will just refuse to open accounts. The employer is mandated to pay. So how would the employer now do that? They will they do They won't pay the money like that, right? So they will not, we as PFAs will not know the owner. But at least you will have fulfilled your own right of it. So Pencom also designed design that. And also they, they ask the PFAs to maintain what they call statutory reserve fund. This fund is basically for them to be able to defend or continue to pay retirement benefit, even if you have exhausted your, your contributions or what your contribution are like, some sort of insurance for your fund. And lastly, they review the law around tax on VC. Before now, there were some loopholes in taxation around um, around VC. That is voluntary contribution. What is so voluntary contribution is in addition to what your employer is removing for your money or deducting from your fund. You also you can contribute more voluntarily. So there were some loopholes around the taxation, and then government decided to block it by releasing a new guideline. So those were the things uh, that the period 2014 dealt. So I move to the next slide, which is, I just want to take talk to us about the current state of the industry. The industry is really big. As we speak, the industry has about 14.27 billion naira as total fund on management. So you can see that it's not small. So some of us that will exercise fear, how will I retire well and all of that? You are covered if what you have in the fund is adequate. But what is very clear is, the industry is very big, right? And the industry has 14.27 across 20 PFAs, right? So that means we have 20 PFAs in Nigeria and they are currently managing 14.27 billion naira, and they're about 9.8 million um, pensioners. Or oh, don't let me see, the, they are not pensioners. People with active RSA account, either still contributing or people withdrawing from it. And just to mention, in all of this, I work for Stambik IBTC Pension Managers, we are the biggest in all ramification in terms of service, in terms of digital, in terms of client base, alien. They are the biggest. I know there are so many metrics. Naira metrics released several articles confirming that they are the biggest. So if you're not with us, I'm not sure you're content. So we can also discuss that for large server after this conversation. So that anybody that's done with Stambik IBTC I can carry the entire last mega to Stambik IBTC. All right, so another question I just want to answer is what is the need for us? For me, we are talking about this pension industry. What is the need for me? And that's the next slide. So the first thing that is need for you is that this current scheme that we have is extremely difficult for people to commit fraud because the three stakeholders must agree to commit fraud. So before now, it was just maybe one government parastata um, so I was trying to explain that the three participators must mutually agree for them to, for any corruption to happen in this industry. And it's difficult because the PFAs are privately owned. You can see that Stambi Capitals is one, Lidway, Park, they are individual companies that they have their own interests to protect. And they want to create sustainable wealth for themselves. Even the PFC, there are three, like I said, there are four. There's First Bank, there's Zenit, there's, I think, Diamond. Uh, yeah, I think there are four. So all of them, they are standalone companies. They want in their own integrity. And they are owned by companies or owners that will not want to just take one of the profits to move on, just like the way government guys will do, right? So three of them must mutually agree. So, sorry, I'll switch the network eventually. I think MTN is just acting up today. 
sorry. So, so that's the first one. The second one is around life insurance, which means that for anybody under this scheme, it is mandatory for your employer to have what we call life insurance policy in place for you. It is part of the PRA 2004. It was also maintained in PRA 2014. So I work, so let me just use someone else. So if you work for any company that opened an RSA account for you, with either Stanbeek or any other company that we currently maintain, right? It is mandatory for your employer to do a life insurance for you. And what does the life insurance do? Number one, if you are not able to work for whatever is a permanent disability that you are not able to work, you are entitled to claim from that insurance. Also, for whatever reason, if there's a death, right, during active service, you're also entitled to uh, insurance. But do you know the meaning of this insurance? It means that if I currently, on an annual basis, if I earn 10 million naira, just for the purpose of scenario, if I earn 10 million on a monthly basis, on an annual basis, if there's a permanent disability or it, if there's a death issue that, okay, I die and I'm not able to work again, I'm entitled to time study of my annual package, my annual gross package as a claim. So meaning that once I, if, oh, no longer if someone is deceased or there's permanent disability, the person is entitled to 30 million naira as compensation for that. This is the benefit of this uh, scheme. A lot of companies do not do this, but we should demand it. It's backed by law, right? So, and that's why sometimes I joke and tell my wife and say, see, yeah, as I'm living, I'm a poor man. No. <laughs> if I die, I'm a big boy <laughs> because that will give you, you have so much money because they'll just go and times three, whatever my annual package and give it to that person. The house that I'm not able to buy when I'm leaving, you'll be able to buy it. And it might be as if the wife killed the husband because the wealth will now be so much that uh, people just, they can't imagine it that the money the guy never had. And I've seen cases like that, that people went to court to go and fight and all of that because they realized that when the wife died, what the husband got as compensation was explainable. Maybe the lady was earning 20 million per, per, per annum and she's still struggling to live in maybe Yanokwaja uh, and all of that. And suddenly she died. They gave the husband 60 million. So that's a big cash, right? So that's one of the benefits of um, this. The other benefit is that the industry is also very competitive. God, time is fast spent. The industry is also very competitive and there are several um, competition between the parties, right? Easy access to your retirement. You have easier access to your retirement. I will explain the problem that people have today. You have easy access to your retirement because private sector is actually driving that. And lastly, is creating employment for people. For someone like us, I became employed by uh, PFA. So, and I know Sambik has over 500 staff, if I'm not mistaken. So, all of the people in this that got employed, PFC also employed people, PENCOM employed people. What are the challenges? Number one is as Muslims, there are some components of the return that's haram because it's interest based. But good enough, PENCOM released a fund called Pen Fund 6, the Sharia Command. So, I'll be rushing an apology. So they really a share compliant fund that we can actually um, now invest in. So if you have not moved your fund to fund six, please do immediately as Muslims, because that is created for us, for a safe investment for us. Secondly is your, re your, your, your retirement benefit is determined by what you pay or the contribution that you have made, unlike before, or got or got entire wealth, but now it's based on what you contribute. So, the scheme is tilted towards people that end better. So when you end better, you will retire better, right? Okay, the third thing is the identification and the documentation issues in, in Nigeria generally. I can be Kazim Lawal with FRC. I can be Kazim uh, Olali Kong L with, um, with name. I can, so I can have different kinds of name on different identification. So for, for you to prove that you are the one and you are the right person, you need to provide adequate documentation. And that's why the process most of the time is come back something, right? So they ask you to provide. And you have seen cases, people coming to claim another person's wealth. 
we have seen people coming to apply for deceased benefit for somebody still living, right? So just to mention that that process is one of the challenges, but I think it's the reality we have to face as a nation. Delay remittance by employers and governments. Sometimes people do not pay money um, and there's strict regulation, meaning that PENCOM is actually very strict, providing guidelines that it's not really flexible for people to now start coming up with different products and all of that. And they are strict because it's the future of, of some people. So I think I've covered the challenge. So I can quickly run to, yes, the seven ways I think you can retire well, and that is the how, right? I need to, yeah, so I'll, I'll just permit, I'll seek permission from the next, so give me a bit of time. So number one is for you to retire well, or to, for you to have a blissful retirement, number one thing you need to do is to conceptualize the kind of retirement you want. That is the beginning conceptualize it, ritualize what you want to do while you are still active and you have money or you have resources at your disposal. You need to think, what do I want to be? What kind of retirement do I want to be? Do I want to retire in Egbeda? Do I want to retire in Lekki? Do I want to retire in London, in Canada, right? Or do I want to in retire in, in Aja or go back to my own time? As we, are, as we are all here today, for you to retire well and have a blissful retirement, you need to visualize what kind of retirement you want for yourself. A lot of us will believe that that time is far, but before you know it, you are 40, 42, 45, 48. One day you just say, Daddy, you'll be 50 years tomorrow. And then you have reached the age of retirement. The official age of retirement in Nigeria is 50, right? So you need to visualize it, have a dream. In fact, like I said earlier, I, 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 I act how I want to retire. Okay, I want to retire in this kind of apartment, in this kind of area. This is the kind of help that I want to have at that time. Me and my Elijah will be carrying our stick and saying, Elijah, yeah, you won't see me. And I, so I always we joke, with, but that is the kind of lifestyle I intend to live when I'm no longer working. Right? There was one time I had like a small debate with my father. My father is a literary. He believes that everything is just at this time, no active investment, just sit down, eat the little thing that government is giving you. I told him, no, when I'm retired, I want to go to London. Those vacations, I'm not able to afford now. I want to afford it then. I want to be able to afford it then, right? So once you are able to visualize what you want for yourself, you will now be able to plan for it, which is you now need to be financially intelligent. And what does that mean? That means that you need to save. The truth is, at that time, your income, depending on the lifestyle or the kind of business you do, you don't have that active, you don't have that power, that energy, that strength for you to follow through on everything again, right? People will be managing it for you and they will be swindling you. Your income, directly or indirectly, will likely go down, except you have a more structured organization that you have built over time, right? So you need to save actively. You need to build a, you need to build a portfolio for yourself. And uh, let me just speak. So when you say you build a portfolio for yourself, the meaning is that you are, you are building a bouquet of investment instruments for yourself. So for example, today, a lot of us, you hear about fish farming, you carry your money, you give them. You hear about farming, you carry your money, you give them. They say, ah, somebody's an importer and exporter. The person is importing anything. Can you make one million naira? You give them, right? You keep giving them all this money, but you are not planning a portfolio for yourself. How do you plan a portfolio for yourself? You first of all, you need to assess yourself to know your level of risk appetite. And my own, and this is not an academic definition. My own definition of risk appetite is how easy is it for me to replace my current fund? I have one thousand now with me. I want to measure my risk capital. How easy is it for me to get another one million naira to replace this money in case this money goes? If it is the level of difficulty in replacing it is my level of appetite, right? If I'm able to replace one thousand naira quickly, then my risk appetite is very high. I can take higher risk. If it's difficult for me to replace that one thousand naira, then my risk appetite is low. A lot of us, our backings are our parents. You can fall back to say, Daddy, give me 1,000 naira there, and they will give you, and you're fine. So you can take a higher risk. If you know you don't have someone that will give you that 1,000 naira, then your risk should be lower. So, and that means that when you are now, when you now have that 1,000 naira, you want to invest with it. How much of this money can I afford to lose? 
that if I lose it, everyone will not fall. I will not cry like a child. So you say, okay, maybe 30, maybe 300 naira. And then you take that 300 naira to what we call a risky investment, such as farming, such as fish, such as importer and exporter, right? The 70% that you have, you need to invest it in something that is safe. When I say safe, meaning that it is highly difficult for you to lose your capital, though the return might be smaller, but it is highly difficult for you to lose your capital, right? So what the way you have now built your portfolio is you have built a portfolio on 70, 30 structure. 30 for something that if it goes, life goes on, I'll just look away. 70, <laughs> this one must not go, right? I need to play this 70 safe, right? Or 700 naira safe. So you should be able to balance it. So some people can be 60, 40. Some people can, be, some people can even be 900 can go without any issue. I can manage 100 naira and I can get a replacement on time. So we need to save our money. And as we are saving, you need to build a portfolio for yourself. So you need to have, in your portfolio, you need to have mutual funds. Mutual funds are a collection of different small, small funds to, to, that investors will take to the market and then give you return and share it with you. And please do not invest your, one of the financial intelligence rules, don't invest with organizations not registered by regulators, right? So just meet people, say, brother, 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 no problem. If you are saying no problem, investment club, all of that, do with the money that is safe for you, maybe 30%, do it. The 70%, you cannot just say, hey, one advert, being 10 naira, collect 20 naira, MMM, and all of that. Aside that they are haram, it is also foolishness to keep your savings, your hand, uh, at end income to waste it on some of those investments. So part of being intelligent with your financials is also to plan to do capital projects. Doing capital project means that you are doing project that will save you much money. Um, sorry, I'm checking the time. I'm already. Okay, so. Uh, I think you can go ahead. You can squeeze okay. another 10 minutes. It's fine. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. So you need to do also, you need to do capital project. Capital project in this case are project that will continue to earn you money even when you are no longer working. So you need to do a lot of capital project, build houses. A lot of us today, we buy lovely, lovely cars, big cars, buy the Homer Jeep of this world, the big Lexus of this world. They are nice things, and we need to enjoy our money. But you should also think about that number one, which is visualizing how you intend to retire. If that Lexus Jeep will block your retire well strategy, please, brother, go and buy Koropay, right? If Koropay will even block it, go and buy bicycle. In fact, if bicycle will do it, use your leg, right? So you need to plan how you want to do capital projects that can tie in wealth in this generation and it can span through generations. So that when I'm retired, I used to have a landlord that is always traveling whenever my rent is due. Once, whenever you pay him his rent, he will collect it, thank you. The next one week, about jackpot to London. He will go to London. He will spend three months in London and then come back again, sit down for another six months. Someone will pay rent again. Baba will go again to London. So that's the kind of lifestyle he has chosen to live, right? So capital investment can give you all of that so that you will not retire and be looking for where to live. And all that. Well, that's when you were active working, you were driving big cars, you were living in big apartment, strategic area, VGC, and all of that. But once you retire, you can no longer afford even a bulega, right? So we need to do, we need to be intelligent financially by saving more, invest wisely and also do capital projects where we are an active service buy houses houses right buy stock they will save once anyway buy stock do a lot of investment stamic capital also have stamic capital asset manager that can also provide sharia compliant investment fund for us in that regard so the second way for us that will be blissful retirement is to be financially intelligent that can be another topic on its own but Intelligent about our finances. Number three is that we need to be very prudent, meaning that the secret of wealth today is to live below your means. People today, Mr. Goega, please, you are you are showing us a video that we should not be seeing, please. So, um, so you need to live far beyond your means, right? Live far, far, far beyond your means. Right, and the meaning of that is avoid as much as possible 
not to live to live over your means. A lot of people they earn one million naira. They are living that people like live that earn five million naira. And that is the secret of wealth is if I earn one million naira, I live a life of 400,000 naira. Leave people, let them continue to speculate. Is it any one million naira? Is it two million? Let, leave the, give them that assignment to continue to speculate about what you actually earn. Live your life with what you need. Where I live my life, and we also see one of my mentors, very respectful mentors, live his life is what do I need? It's not what I can afford. If what I need is a bicycle, even if I can afford a Homer Jeep, I will buy my bicycle and leave it. If what my kids need right now is to attend a, a, a modest Islamic school, it's fine. Don't go and compete and say, my child must go here, must be this, must go for vacation. If, that's, if they don't need it for now, please keep it away from them. What you don't need, don't spend your money on. Be prudent about it and avoid debts. Don't borrow money unnecessarily. Right? Don't just say, hey, I want to buy this car, two million naira car. That's what you want to buy. You can afford, but you have one million. Instead of you to look for one million naira car, that is your level. I'll be contented with it. You can't borrow one million naira to buy the two million naira car. After driving that car three months, they tell you that the gear is bad. And as a result, you need to spend two million naira to repair it, to repair the gear. You borrow another money. You keep borrowing, and then your, your debt profile is suddenly just bloated and you, 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 you have issues. So be prudent about the way you spend your money. Live a modest life. Number four is stay healthy. For you to have a blissful retirement, you need to stay healthy. Eat well. Eat balanced diet. Be active, right? A lot of us will take it for granted, particularly now that we now work from home. I don't work from home again, no. <laughs> but there are people work from home. You see them, they take it for granted by sitting, all those sedentary lifestyle and all that. So for you to retire well, one of the ways to have a blissful retirement is for you to have a very active life. And I joined, I realized that Samsung did something. They called it, I think Samsung exercise or something. They called it together. Meaning that you can trek globally. You can join global trekking competition. And I do. At least I've joined for, I think, about four or five months now. And we've been trekking globally. I've not met the target, but I keep trekking, keep trekking, keep trekking. So it's a lifestyle we all need to just look at. It's well. Don't say because you are a, you, you are a big boy. You eat pizza in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night. No, you are not planning for your retirement. For you to have a good retirement, you also need to live ahead of because if, if even if you have 10 billion in your account, if you retire and you have medical issues, all of those things will be eroded, just one click, right? So staying healthy is the way to have a blissful retirement. Number five is also maintain good relationship with family and friends. At that time, there's nobody that will give you credit in the office. There's nobody you will gist with. There's no boss that will give you stress, nothing. You just be alone, you are the boss, you are everything. You'll be tired right? You'll be bored, right? But if you have good friends, you have good relationships with people, people will check on you, people will visit you, you'll visit people. People will do uh, Ashwabi or what is, what is it called? Um, the, what, I, I forgot what they use for party these days. So people invite you, you go there, you associate and enjoy your life, right? It's one of the ways to have a blissful retirement. Number six is also maximize your retirement savings account. I've told us about the scheme and how the scheme is critical and how it is protected. So if you're an employee, do not look away. Like I told us in Stamica BTC, we have a mobile app, we have a web portal, we have all of that. Please, constantly check what you are getting. A lot of people will not know that they are having missing contributions. Sometimes your employers will skip and skip and skip and skip without paying. You don't even know because you care less about this. Check your statement. Log into your mobile app. Check it. Have I been paid for January? How much am I expecting? I'm expecting 100,000 here. They paid you 98,000. HR, what happened? I'm seeing 2,000 or less. Engage them consistently. There was one time that I got higher um, influence to my pension. I called, I'm working with the PFA. I called my employer. HR, what is that? They said there was a penalty that was blah, blah, blah. So, and I got the money. So you need to constantly know if your money is growing. And that's why a lot of us, we don't even know the Sharia compliance fund is not in the industry because we already pay attention. So let us pay attention to it. Let's keep asking, right? If you're self-employed too, this is a dangerous zone. A lot of self-employed people are not cultured about saving money for their future. They get the money, they buy the house, they buy the car, and that is the end. You can also open a micro-pension for yourself where 
you will get that money and then when you retire you can get it i used to tell sometimes people will complain that the money is small i say yeah it's small but if you're a big boy and that's truly blessed you and you have money that money you can even be using it to be financing the data of your grandchildren or never see to say on a monthly basis i've been kidding i'll be sending you one thousand dollars i'll be sending you one, even hundred dollars from my retirement even if you don't need it just keep the money the money will come and the, and lastly, it's for you to constantly make effort to establish profitable alternative sources of income, right? It is important. Don't seek to say, I'm only going to, about, I have an account with my PFA and that is the only thing I'm returning. It is not going to be enough, right? It's just pushing the effect of what you need at that time. So establish businesses, invest your wealth and get as much as you want um, in terms of um, return. So I'm saying here, yeah, take calculated risk when you are still actively working. And calculated risk is not, I'm just saying, I'm not saying just go and invest in anything. Look at it. If it's something that you can try, try it. You can take risk. Now, and that, don't forget my definition of risk capital. If you lose your monthly salary, you can get another salary next month. So you can, you can gamble with that salary, right? But you can also, all of this, you can plan it and do it like that. So in my own opinion, these are the seven ways I think if you follow them, You'll be able to have a blissful retirement visualize what you want to have be financially intelligent be prudent and live below your means stay healthy maintain good relationship with family and friends maximize your retirement savings account and open one if you don't have i can you can contact me directly and i will help you in doing that and lastly ensure that you have a backup of investment for yourself i'm sorry that i've spent more than the time i have to me i pray that's what i make this Beneficial to each and every one of us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakum la khairan. Uh, wa alaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakum la khairan. I mean, uh, I, I wish that you can actually continue because I'm actually enjoying you and I'm sure that's the case for every other person too. I mean, this has been um, um, uh, very educative and expository. And um, I'm sure that we'll still have to bring you back to do more justice to this topic. I mean, uh, I'm sure people have one or two questions to to uh, to ask. So please, if you have question or clarification or whatsoever, kindly drop your question in the chat box. Or I mean, do make use of the reactions um, a button here to raise your hand if you have any question. Okay. So one of one key thing that you talked about is um, uh, that we should avoid investing in businesses that are not registered with regulators. I mean, I think that's very very critical because we've seen cases where people put their money into so many business uh, in businesses that are not regulated. I mean, they're not just putting in small money; they are putting huge amounts in such businesses. I mean, I think it's a key key note for us to also. Um, to, to note. Um, yes, okay, so I'll start looking at the questions and, um, okay. So one question here says that as young and practicing engineers, what are some capital projects we can invest our little earnings in? Um, I can go ahead, right? Okay, yes, please, please. So I'll just take them one by one, yes. Okay. I I think there's one before that, and that person are actually expecting it, which is okay. I saw what that. You... What can you say <laughs> about the FG borrowing the pension fund? Yeah, yeah. I was going to, I was going to take it. So too. I think I'll start with that one because I okay. know it's an interesting okay, question, please. and everybody would keep asking that question. So just to make it clear, uh, okay, maybe I should leave it of this clear because I like this about you're always fighting about Buari or no Buari. I'm not a. I used to be a fan of Buari, right, and some of the issues that we're having recently, I, I decided, I'm still a fan of Buhari, but I decided that we should stop giving him the excuse and criticizing objectively with the way we've been doing before, right? Why did I set this uh, premise and this disclaimer? It's to say that this Ula Balu, or the exaggeration, escalation around the FG borrowing is, I think is, we, sh we are learned people, right? We should not toe that line. Government has been borrowing, and there's no government of the world. Please quote me. There's no government of the world that is borrowing. There's nobody. Right? So government is borrowing, and they will continue to borrow, and they will continue to borrow, and they will continue to borrow. 
and the safest form of um, borrowing is government borrowing because it's the economy that is backing it. It's the government themselves that are backing it. And they have, even if they embezzle that money, they'll pay the money, right? So I just want to set that context because people now say, ah, they didn't. So government borrowing the pension fund is not a problem in any way. And I will explain. So government do not come to tell um, the PFS is tell them, give me this money. That's not the way borrowing is doing. That's not, that is not how borrowing is being done. Apologies. Borrowing is done via debt management office, DMO, and they issue bonds. Even Sukuk is a form of bond, uh, borrowing, right? Sukuk that we all know today is a form of borrowing. So when go government borrows that money, they borrow it and provide what they call coupon or let's say interest or return for it. If you borrow me one million error, I'll give you 5% at the end of the borrowing term. And government has been paying their own part of the money, right? So it is natural that government continues to borrow it. If government is not able to borrow, sorry, if government is not able to repay the money, I can tell you, all of us will not be living again. People in Syria, so they, those are the places government is not able to repay. Syria, the war zone, and all that. Government is already going and they will continue to pay. So. It is, and it's a process that is properly managed by the regulator and even professionals. So if you have that problem of, oh, government is borrowing, I'm just think about it. So cook is also a form of borrowing. And if nobody's raising high bro on that, so government will continue to borrow. And one of the ways to borrow and also give you return as investors or as people with the owner of the fund is borrowing from, is government borrowing it and giving you return for it. Though, like I said earlier, some of them are, um, Harombo Sukuk has come to purify some of the funds and investment and all of that. So as young and practicing engineers, what, what have, capital project that you can do, the simple logic for identifying capital projects, the underlying principle is anything that generates income is capital. Anything that in, involves maintaining, using money to, um, to maintain it is a liability, right? So if you buy a car, Car is a liability, right? I know some of us will start going to say, ah, car can be capital. Yes, I agree, it can be actually. But in the general terms, if you buy car just for driving car, it's a liability because you'll be financing it and it will be depreciating. A car you buy for one million, except the Toyota car made that, <laughs> the, the Toyota, the Uber cars. Once you buy a car, it starts depreciating immediately. So what are the capital projects? For example, buying a house, buying a land, and all of this, you know, there are, there are principles governing them. Where did you buy it from? What are the documentation on the property that you are buying? Where, what is the viability of that land? Where you are buying it? What is the safety? All of that has to be put together. But capital project that can easily come to my head is like buying a house, buying a land, right? Or even buying instruments like Sukuk, long-time investments, bonds, all of those things. Buying them, they are a form of asset. They will tie down your money, but they'll be giving you periodic return, even across generation. So I think I will just stop if they want to take another one. Okay, uh, uh, there's another question that says, um, what's the duration for remittances for individual or nest of kin? I'm not too sure if that's, if that's um, I mean, that's not pretty clear. I don't know if you understand it, sir. So it says, what's the duration for remittances for individual or nest of kin? I mean, is it, I mean, it's not clear. It's not really clear, but I'm thinking if it's for disease payment. Exactly. So if, it, so if it's for disease payment, first, the first correction is nest of kin is not for disease payment in Nigerian pension industry. So if you have, <laughs> if you have an account with an with PFE and you have it nest of kin, the meaning of that nest of kin is who should contact when we are not able to reach you? That's the meaning of readiness talking. The people that benefit from that money, they are called beneficiaries, right? And beneficiaries, your um, beneficiaries are only empowered by letter of administration by a court of law in Nigeria, or you get a will that is executed into the court. Court has executed and accepted that will for you. We have another subsidiary of Stambi Capital called the Stambi Capital City Trustees. They issue simple will that can help you deal this. Right? And I think it's about, 
think is it 5,500 annually for you to maintain. So what is, just to maintain that nest of kin is not somebody that will get your money. Nest of kin, somebody will contact. Beneficiary are the people that will take your money. And the beneficiary is only defined to, to, through two means, either by will or, or by letter of administration to by God. What is the duration? So the first thing you will know, know is who is the beneficiary first? It takes long time to define your beneficiaries. A lot of families are always fighting. I'm, I'm the, yeah, Olo Magba is the husband, is the first child, I'm the first son, a lot of that. So you need to define how long that will take and you provide either a will or a letter of admission. Once you provide either of these two, we will go back to the courts to go and verify if these documents are valid because people also bring fake documents. So, so you can see the process of getting it, going back to validate, there's no predefined time. But once all of these documentations are sorted and it's approved by PENCOM, I can say that it takes less than five days for you to get paid. But the documentation is really true. Thank you. Okay. I mean, because of time, uh, we really want no one to, we cannot uh, take more questions. But of course, definitely, I'm sure our brother will be available to answer our questions. Please, um, we'd like to have your mail address um, so people can. Um, I mean, send them, send you uh, uh, whatever question that they need to, they need you to answer, please. I can see quite a number of questions here. So I'm sure we'll, we'll do justice to that. So I really appreciate you. And I'm sure that um, uh, there will be need for us to bring you back because I'm sure people are actually very interested in, in this topic. So we thank you so much. May, may Allah continue to bless you and um, I mean, can't you strength to be able to, to carry on in this? And um, so, um, so we'd like to um, call on um, the president in, of Last Omega and in person of Engineer Jawando to, to give us a, a vote of thanks. I'm sorry, before he does, before, before he does that, we'd like to give a, a, an announcement for next week's um, session, which um, will be taken by Dr. Abubakar Abbas. A lecturer in Petroleum and Gas Engineering University of South of Manchester. And the topic will be the Nigeria Decade of Gas Initiative. So I'm sure we all know that um, Nigeria actually uh, did um, a decade of gas, um, and that was last year. And um, so gas is also becoming a, very, a major um, product in Nigeria, as it were. So, I mean, so let's try and make it a date. So we call, I call, call on uh, Engineer Jawando to to give a vote of thanks, please. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I go into that, uh, I need to call, uh, one of the reasons why we deem this topic necessary at this point is because of the experiences some of us have been having with people in the communities and our senior professionals who have retired, especially in the public sector. In the last four or five years, I've had a series of cases where people retired without any on ground. Okay, I can barely hear the president. I don't know if it's from my end. Hello? Hello? Hello, yeah? Hello? Yeah, I'm salam alaikum. Why something long? No. I can be, is that, is that engineer Jawando? I can barely, okay. Oh, I think you're speaking, but we can't hear you. Thank you.
No, I think we lost Jawan do. Um, yes, okay, I he's think he's back. speaking. He's, he's, he's speaking, speaking, but he's not talking. Okay. I think he's speaking, but we can't hear him. I can see his yeah. video. Let me reach out to him. I'll reach out to him now. Hello, Mr. Ido. You can go ahead with the session. You will be logged in. Okay. He has logged out, so he will log in again. Sorry about that. Okay, so wait for him to okay. join again. Yes. I mean, because that's okay, about... Okay, so while he's logging in, let me just make a brief uh, comment on the next week session. So the next week session is about the Nigeria decade of gas. As we all know now that uh, one of the main strategic focus in our oil and gas industry is the transition to the gas, right? So there'll be a lot of opportunities in that space in few times to come. Uh, big industries are regasifying their energy process. That is, they are migrating from fuel, petrol, diesel to gas. So there are a lot of opportunities that will be coming up for entrepreneurs in terms of the value chain in that particular process. So it's going to be a big one. So we want to open our minds to that space so that the entrepreneurs amidst us can also play along and you know, translate some of those opportunities to economic benefit for themselves. So the lecturer that we'll be bringing on board, Engine Abaka, is presently a lecturer at the University of Southford in United Kingdom. However, he has practiced in Nigeria and he also he, he was the one of the major key stakeholders in the OPEC during the regime of um, the last uh, OPEC. Uh, is it secretary? That's uh, is it Bakindo from Nigeria. So he's highly experienced in that space and uh, we are looking forward to him to come and deliver to us the lecture and the opportunities around that space. I also employ everyone to also be in attendance. So the session will come out 2 p.m. It's going to be between the hours of 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Nigerian time next week, Sunday. That's 28th of August. So before the week comes out, we are going to share these um, posters, the link, and what have you. So we also advise everyone to keep uh, the eye on our platforms, likewise on our website to get further details. Thank you. So I think the Andrew is back. So he can now have his uh Jawandu. And you are Jawandu. Salam alaikum. Okay, I, I, I don't know what's happened then. Okay, uh, like I was saying, we all need to start planning for our retirement at a very early age. If I were to advise, I would say immediately we start work. And uh in the past few years now, I've had a lot of experiences with people that are going to retire. Some of them will tell you seven years, they still have enough time. And uh, they ended up retiring. And one of the main challenges they're having is how to get funds to even sustain themselves or their families. And you have to start writing to Zakat organizations, friends to contribute. That is not a way to retire well. So I thank Brother. Uh, Kazim Lawal for doing justice to the topic, talking about the rules of the PFA, how you can maximize that, your investments into non-risky businesses, even if you want to go into some a bit risky business, maybe in your 20s and early 30s, you can still try that, but not like the, the likes of MMM. But by the time you are getting to 33, 34, 35, you need to really be very focused and start focusing on the very low risk investments. I thank you very much sir, for making out time to come and educate us on this. And also the professional development committee for making this happen 
And I know we have a lot of series of other topics. So I implore each and every member that has been here today to join us for the other sessions, because all of these sessions tied together are meant to make us better professionals in what we are doing now and also preparing us for our future. I thank everybody that has made our time today to be part of this. We know we are all busy. Saturday in uh, Nigeria is either for Uwambe or for resting. So thank you very much for making our time. I pray Allah SWT accept this as an act of ibadah from us. Allah Amin. Thank you for that. Um brief and apt one um so i mean not only the next item on the agenda is uh, closing dua so i'd like to call on um, the pastor amir of um uh, Muslim, mss in last week where who is also an alumni now uh, in person of uh, rasodik ido kindly come to the virtual lectern and uh, give us a closing dua are you there Rasodik Ido, are you there? Okay, I think you can have a rabbi take that. Hello, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, Mati Allah for his mercies and blessings and his guidance over us and for making today's session a reality and a success. To give my Allah a seat from us as an army, and we uh, keep us alive till next week and beyond, inshallah, so that we can make another outstanding uh, lecture, inshallah. One of the big guys, Mr. Jamal Sifun, Assalam. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining this. Um, we pray to Allah SWT to keep us beyond um, next week where we're having another session of this. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi